Solomon offered burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar, which he had built for the Lord, and he burned incense with them on the altar that was before the Lord. And so he finished the temple. Solomon is acting in a role that he's not called to act in. He doesn't get to the place where he's just as outright offering children in the valley of Ben Hinnom. He starts doing little things along the way to get there. And that's what happens in our lives. Most of the time, you know, we don't, we don't act upon those big sins until we're first committing those little ones, those little compromises that just begin to weaken us spiritually until then we're doing the big sins because along the way we've allowed ourselves to have these little compromises. And that's what is happening here with Solomon. His heart is breaking down. We're going to be 1 Kings chapter 8, so if you have your Bibles, if you want to turn there to 1 Kings chapter 8. We left off last week, this is a, a long chapter with uh, 66 verses, so we left off at verse 54. And I'm going to uh, put the points up from the first part of chapter 8 as just a quick summary, um, and then we'll dive into the latter part of chapter 8. But this is the time period that we're talking about, the rule of King Solomon. He's the third king of Israel. He has been called by the Lord to build a temple to the Lord, which he does. It takes him seven years to build the temple to the Lord. He spends another 13 years building his own palace. We talked about that, how it kind of uh, is a crack in, the, in, the, in the, the door leading to potential compromise because Solomon is spending twice as, almost twice as many years building his own house as he did the house of the Lord. So what does that say about him? And we're beginning to see kind of a slow deterioration in Solomon over the years. Uh, but, he, but he's called by the Lord and, and is obedient in building a house to the Lord. And in chapter 8, as we've been going through the book of 1 Kings, we've been looking at different principles that we've gleaned from these different chapters. And in the first 53 verses of this chapter, we saw eight principles that we went over last week. Number one, God does what God says. Number two, God is not restricted by space or time. He is omnipresent. Number three, God is faithful to forgive us when we confess our sins. Number four, God has a heart for all nations, not just Israel. And number five, God always honors the prayer of the humble. And so we left off here at verse 54. Let me pause and pray and we'll see how far we get tonight as we just continue through the book of 1 Kings. Father God, we just want to thank you for being here with us where two or more are gathered. You're in our midst. And so... Lord, we trust that you've been glorified through our worship, through our time of prayer, and now as we seek you through your word, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, minister your truth to us. I thank you for those who are here and those who are watching online tonight. We just commit the Bible study to you. We're grateful that we can be here in your house to glorify you, to worship you, to read your word and to do what it says, and we thank you together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Verse 54 says, And so it was, when Solomon had finished praying all this prayer and supplication to the Lord, that he arose from before the altar of the Lord, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. And then he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud vo a voice, saying... And so then in, in verse 58 and following, he is going to address the people. So this is on the heels of his prayer of dedication. After he builds the temple to the Lord, then he prays a prayer of dedication to the Lord, dedicating the temple to God. And now he rises to his feet. He's been kneeling as part of this prayer posture, and he's had his hands raised up to heaven. Then he stands upright, and he addresses the people who have gathered there for this time of dedication. And he says in verse 56, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise which he promised through his servants, Moses. Now I'd like you to circle there in verse 56 the words given rest given rest. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel. Where does ultimate rest come from? It comes from the Lord. 
That's what Solomon is saying here. Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people. It is a good reminder. We're just continuing this list from chapter 8. It's number 6 in our list. Our rest is found in the Lord. Our rest is found in the Lord. This is something that uh, Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, and verse 28 to 30. He said, Come to me, all you, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in spirit, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So he's talking there about this imagery of oxen who are harnessed together under the same yoke. And there would generally be an older, more experienced oxen who knows how to plow well, harnessed to one who is not as experienced, not as big. And, And so the younger ox would learn from the older ox as they would plow together. And Jesus is saying to us, when you are harnessed to me, when you are yoked with me, then your life is so much easier. Because if you're yoked with me, I will bring rest to your souls. There won't be any striving and labor. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And so Solomon reminds us here that this ultimate rest that comes to our souls, to our heart, comes from the Lord. This is what David would also write in Psalm 23, verses 2 and 3, where he said that he makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me beside still waters. You know, this is this imagery of God is our shepherd, and he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. You know, the imagery of Psalm 23 is we are the sheep, and he is the shepherd. Sheep, their nature is that they are scared of running water. They will only drink from still water. I don't know if you know that about sheep, but they will not drink from moving water like out of a stream. They will only drink from like a, a, a pool of water, a pond, a bucket of water. They're scared of running water. You would be too if you're wearing like a thousand sweaters. You don't want to fall into a, <laughs> you fall in and get all wet and then, you know, drown. You, you know, you would instantly drown. And so they're, they're aware of this. And so they're, they're frightened animals and they only drink out of still water. That's the imagery there. David says, you, you make me lie down in green pastures. You leave me beside still waters, like it's safe. You restore my soul. And so that ultimate rest only comes in the Lord. And and all of us need that, you know, because life is full of its share of worries and fears and anxieties. And where do we find rest for our souls? It's in the Lord. And as as Solomon is addressing the people here in chapter 8 of 1 Kings, he's reminding us the Lord is the one who gives us that ultimate rest. May we find our rest in the Lord, that he... That's the rest of verse 58, that he may incline, well, sorry, verse 57, may the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. And, and I love this part there in verse 57 where he says, may the Lord God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us. That phrase is often repeated through the Bible. Uh, it, is, it is mentioned in Deuteronomy 4, verse 31, Deuteronomy 31, verse 6, Joshua 1, verse 5, 1 Chronicles 28, 20. Even in the New Testament, in Hebrews 13, 5, the writer of Hebrews is quoting this same phrase that God will never leave us nor forsake us. And so it is a good reminder to us. It's number seven on our list. You might at sometimes feel like God is not responding to your prayers. Where is God You know, my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. I feel alone. Where is he in my time of need? But we have to remember the promise of God. He will never leave us nor forsake us. It doesn't really, you know, our feelings are not dependent. So when you sometimes feel like God's not with me, he promises to always be with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. We are never alone. The Lord is always with us. And Solomon in his exhortation here with the people He's saying, may the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us. And and verse 58 again, that he may incline our hearts to himself 
to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers and may these words of mine with which I have made supplication before the Lord be near the Lord our God day and night that he may maintain the cause of his servant and the cause of his people Israel as each day may require. Notice this, verse 60, that all the peoples of the earth may know the Lord is God. There is no other. Let your heart, therefore, be loyal to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as at this day. And so that's number eight from this chapter. May our heart be loyal and our walk be faithful to God. That's what he's saying here to the people. He's like, God has given us rest this temple we have built, we have peace from our enemies. God has given us rest. May you not leave us nor forsake us. All the people of, of the earth, may they know that he's the Lord, that there's no other. And may we keep our hearts loyal and our walk faithful to the Lord our God. So verse 62, and then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings which he offered to the Lord, 22, check this out, 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. That's a lot. 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. And so the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. So this actually is turning in here to a feast. This is not just that they are making sacrifices to the Lord, which they are. But typically here, what would happen is they're offering sacrifices as a ritual sacrifice. A portion of the animals would be dedicated to the Lord and the rest would be given to the priest and the people to feast upon. So this is like a huge barbecue is what they're having here. So some of it is unto the Lord and then the people are feasting on the rest of this. So, you know, how many people are here are not mentioned, but that's why 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep are needed. That's a lot of lamb chop. And, uh, and the people are getting their, their fill here. And it says in verse 64, on the same day, the king consecrated the middle of the court that was in front of the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings, grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings, because the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small to receive the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, and the fat of the peace offerings. At that time, it says, Solomon held a feast. See, this is how we get the idea. This is more than just sacrificial offerings. This is for the people also. Solomon held a feast and all Israel with him. A great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt before the Lord our God, seven days and seven more days, 14 days. That, that's a long feast. But it's actually tied to the Feast of Tabernacles. Let me explain. Next verse, verse 66. On the eighth day, he sent the people away, and they blessed the king and went to their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel, his people. And so it's, it seems a little contradictory there because it says that the feast lasted seven days, of seven more days, a total of 14 days. But then on verse 66, it says on the eighth day, he sent the people away. So eighth day, 14 days, seven and seven. What is this all about? What, what it tells us here, when you look at the, the time and the season of this dedication, and you look at how this, there were two separate feasts. One was seven days, another one was seven days, and then on the eighth day, they went home. What it tells us is that there was a feast dedicating the temple to the Lord that lasted seven days, and it, it flowed into the Feast of Tabernacles because of the season in which they are dedicating the temple, and the Feast of Tabernacles lasted for eight days. The eighth day, the people were done with the Feast of Tabernacles. So what the text is suggesting to us is that there was a combined feast here. Seven days dedicating to uh, the temple of the Lord, followed immediately by another seven-day feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. Then on the eighth day, the people went home, the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. So the whole thing lasts two weeks, and then on day, basically day 15, they, they went home. But what a great dedication this was. And now the temple has been completed. The articles of the temple are within the temple. The altar of uh, the brazen altar outside, the, the, the sea we talked about, also these various articles. So the temple's done. And people for the first time have a permanent place in Jerusalem 
where they can come and offer the sacrifices to the Lord, where once a year the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, make atonement for the sins of the nation. And this would be the central place of worship now. And this, this temple that Solomon built, he, he built around the year 967 B.C., and it stands for 381 years until the Babylonians come in in 586 B.C., and they're going to destroy the temple, which, which actually we're going to see a glimpse of here as we continue to read the result of their dis, the Israel's disobedience. God said, this temple will not stand if you walk in disobedience, and it would come to pass. But let's, let's uh, take a look further here now into chapter 9. In chapter 9, it says, And it came to pass when Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house. All right? So now 20 years have passed because seven years to build the house of the Lord, 13 years to build the king's house. And all Solomon's desire, which he wanted to do, verse 2, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. Okay, so... When Solomon was first made king, after the death of his father David, Solomon was only 18 to 20 years of age. And back in chapter 3 of 1 Kings, the Lord appears to Solomon. And that's when he asked Solomon that question, like, what do you want me to do for you? Like, blank check Solomon. And that's when Solomon said, I need wisdom. Because all of this that I've been called to do at such a young age is beyond me. I need wisdom. And so God said, because you have asked for wisdom and not other selfish things, I'm going to give you victory over your enemies. I'm going to give you provisions like you've never known. I'm going to take care of you. And so God blessed Solomon more than even what Solomon had asked. But that's the first time that God appeared to him back in chapter 3 when Solomon was like 18 to 20 years of age. Now, God appears to him a second time here. And because uh, we know that the temple took seven years and this palace took 13 years. 20 years have now passed. So now Solomon is 38 to 40 years of age. So we're rapidly moving here through Solomon's life. He's now 38 to 40 years of age, and the Lord appears to him now a second time. Verse 3, And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have consecrated this house which you have built to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. Now, if, notice this, if you walk before me as your father David walked in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then, then, I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, as I promised David, your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. So pause right there. In the margin of your Bible, you can just write the word rewards. Rewards. Because God is speaking to Solomon here, and he's saying, I have some rewards for you. But this is conditional. It's if. If you walk before me. And notice he's not asking Solomon for perfection because he says, if you walk before me, as did your father David. Was David a perfect man? Not by a long shot. But he says, if you walk with me with integrity of heart and uprightness, because despite David's failures, he was a man after God's heart. And he at least would repent of his sins. And he kept a short account with God. So God is not asking Solomon to be perfect. Because he's using his own father, David, as an example. But he says, I want you to walk with integrity and uprightness of heart. And if you do these things, you're going to be blessed. If you do these things, you will not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel as your descendants. But then we get to verse 6, where the first word is, but. And that's a big but, ladies and gentlemen. But if you or your sons at all turn from following me and do not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land which I have given them and this house, which I have consecrated for my name, 
I will cast out of my sight. Israel will be a proverb and a byword among all the peoples. And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and will hiss and say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? And then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have embraced other gods and worshiped them and served them, therefore the Lord has brought all this calamity on them. Now for this section, you can write in the margin of your Bible, consequences. Because what the Lord is saying here, this is principle number one from chapter nine, is that with God there are rewards and there are consequences. Rewards for faithfulness, consequences for unfaithfulness. And so God leads with rewards. He says, but if, if you turn from me, you start worshiping other gods, then this, ta- this house of mine will be destroyed and people will walk by the rubble and they will hiss. They will like, you know, be like, like, you know, like what has happened here? And, and they will be told, well, it's because they forsook the Lord and they started worshiping other gods. So Solomon's temple will stand for 381 years, but it will be destroyed in 586 BC by the Babylonians because the people will engage in idolatry. And unfortunately, Solomon will be the first king to lead them down that path. He will marry foreign wives, which we will see in a few chapters. And these foreign wives, not that there's anything wrong with interracial or international marriages. It's the problem is these foreign wives were pagan women who did not worship the Lord their God. So that was the problem. And they brought their paganism into the marriage and they influenced Solomon and he led the people in idolatry. They worshiped the gods Chemosh and Molech under Solomon's reign, which involved child sacrifices. The va- there's a valley in Israel, the Valley of Ben Hinnom, that is also known as the Valley of the Children because so many children were slaughtered in that valley. And it was all under the reign of King Solomon. And so even though the the temple will stand for 381 years, God will eventually say enough is enough and allow the Babylonians to come in 586 BC and destroy it. And, And so what God says here will come to pass because God is faithful to his word. And so we see here, read on with me. In verse... Ten. Now it happened at the end of 20 years when Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house. Hiram, the king of Tyre, had supplied Solomon with cedar and cypress and gold as much as he desired. Now remember this guy. Hiram was, was hired by Solomon to bring the cedar wood from Lebanon. Hiram is the king of Tyre, which Tyre is a city within today modern Lebanon. And, um, and so, so here's how Solomon pays him. As much as he desired, that King Solomon then gave Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. Now, the word cities in in Hebrew here is irim, and irim can mean settlements. There's not really 20 cities in the Galilee region, but they are settlements. These are little villages. And so Solomon gave Hiram 20 of these villages, these settlements in the land of Galilee. And then Hiram went from Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given him, but they did not please him. And so he said, what kind of cities are these which you have given me, my brother? And he called them the land of Kabul. Now, if you have some of your Bibles have a footnote right there. Kabul translates good for nothing. (laughs) These cities are good for nothing. This is Kabul. As they are to this day. And then Hiram sent the king 120 talents of gold. So here's what we're reading. In, in In the process of building the temple... Solomon recruited Hiram, king of Tyre. This guy's, this guy's a Gentile. He's not a Jew, but, but he had favorable relations with another foreign king. The cedars of Lebanon were, mani- were magnificent. He wanted the cedar wood to panel the interior. He also wanted the gold to overlay the, the cedar paneling. And so Solomon then uh, says to Hiram, tell you what I'm going to do. I got a deal for you. And he basically mortgages off 20 cities or settlements to Hiram. 
and says, I'll, I'll, I'll mortgage off these cities to you in exchange for you giving me some gold. Now, let me just translate for you. How much gold did Hiram give King Solomon for these cities? Well, he gave him 120 talents of gold, okay? One talent in ancient times was 70 pounds, all right? So I did the math on this to figure out today's equivalent, all right? I looked up today, gold is going for about $2,500 an ounce. One talent is 70 pounds. You got 120 talents here. So 120 times 70 pounds. Then you got to figure that out into ounces. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the equivalent today of $336 million. So Hiram sees these little podunk settlements and he's like, for my $336 million, I'm getting these? You got to be kidding me, my brother, you know? He's not even related to him. He's not even, you know, a Jew. But Hiram's like, my brother, you know, come on here. Somebody's, somebody's pulling the wool over my eyes here. But that's what he gets for it. And, and Hiram's like, cobble. This all this stuff is cobble. That's what that is. Translates to, you know, something pretty nasty. But we're just going to say good for nothing. All right? And verse 15, and this is the reason for the labor force which King Solomon raised to build the house of the Lord, his own house, the Milo. Now, the Milo, it's interesting because it, that's not the name of a town. Uh, my footnote says the landfill, but really what the Milo was was um, an embankment. Um, it, it was a terracing, especially they think on the eastern side of the city of Jerusalem to help buttress the, the walls of the city. So we don't know exactly what Milo was. That's the best guess. And then it says he also had this labor force for the wall of Jerusalem. And then notice these three cities, Hazor, Megiddo, and Gezer. And then it says in parenthesis, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and taken Gezer and burned it with fire, had killed the Canaanites who dwelt in the city. This is before Solomon. And had given it as a dowry to his daughter, Solomon's wife. Solomon does marry uh, Pharaoh's daughter, and so Pharaoh had previously, the king of Egypt had previously uh, wiped out the Canaanites in the city of Gezer, and then he gives it to his uh, daughter as a gift. But Solomon sets up these three cities, Hazor, Megiddo, and Gezer, as fortified chariot cities. And they were positioned in strategic places. Because Solomon, is a, is, he's, a, he's a wise guy. He, he does some very dumb things, but he's very wise. God has given him wisdom. So he sets up Hazor in the, in the very far north, which is about three miles north of the Sea of Galilee. And that's a fortified chariot city. So he can intercept any forces coming from the north along the Via Maris, which was a trade route that cut along the Mediterranean coast and then, went, then shot over towards uh, Iraq and Iran in that area. So he's got Hazor up there. Then he's got Megiddo, which is in central Israel by the Jezreel Valley. And that was another trade route. And so he's got another uh, fortified city there. Those of you who have gone with me to Israel, it's one of the ancient places we stop is the city, the, the, the Tal of Megiddo. About 27 different ancient civilizations have built upon themselves. So now it's like this hill, this Tal that's mound. But Solomon had um, they've uncovered uh, different horse stables there for his chariots, and that Megiddo itself could accommodate more than 400 horses. And so uh, Solomon used that as a strategic location. Now remember, remember if you know your Bibles, Megiddo is mentioned in the book of Revelation chapter 16, because the hill of Megiddo, Har Megiddo, is Armageddon. And the valley of Megiddo the valley that is right there by Megiddo, which is also known as the Jezreel Valley, but there in proximity to Megiddo, it's known as the Valley of Megiddo. That's Armageddon. That's where the final battle will take place. The Bible predicts and prophesies how, the, how all the kings of the east will come and gather uh, for war against the Lord in the Valley of Megiddo. So that's Armageddon. So that's this same location here. And then Gezer is down. It's the, it's the road... Um, on the, along the west coast from the city of Joppa, which is a port city on the, west, on the west coast of Israel, on the Mediterranean, and it cuts through to Jerusalem. So that's another strategic location. So he's got these fortified chariot cities in the north, in the central area, and then towards the south near Jerusalem and between Joppa and Jerusalem. And so he's positioning himself to, to be able to defend the land of Israel with these three cities here. 
In verse 17, and Solomon built Gezer, also lower Beth Haron, uh, Belath, and Tadmor uh, in the wilderness in the land of Judah. And all the storage cities that Solomon had, cities for his chariots and cities for his cavalry, and whatever Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, and in all the land of his dominion. And all the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, who were not of the children of Israel, that is, their descendants who were left in the land after them, whom the children of Israel had not been able to destroy completely. From these, Solomon raised forced labor as it is to this day. But of the children of Israel, Solomon made no forced laborers because they were men of war and his servants, his officers, his captains, commanders of his chariots and his cavalry. Now, let's just pause and understand these groups of people mentioned there in verse 20, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, these were perennial enemies of the Israelites. And they were in the land of Israel before the, um, before the, the Hebrew people got there, before the Jews got there, after their captivity in Israel, and God, uh, rather their captivity in Egypt, and God had said to the Israelites, I want you to drive them out. I want you to completely drive them out. Well, they didn't. And so pockets of these people were still in the land of Israel, the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And Solomon decides, well, we were supposed to drive these people out, but since we didn't drive them out, we weren't obedient to God. I'm going to make them into forced labor. And they're going to do our work. I'm not going to use the children of Israel into forced labor. They're going to be my army, and they're going to be my officers and servants. Forced labor is going to be these people that we should have driven out. Now, folks, at first, this might look like strategy here, but, it's, but this is compromise because they were supposed to be driven out and instead Solomon is using them. And you're going to see here these little bitty tiny compromises. We'll see, we'll see some others here, but this, this, is, this is compromise because he's using the people that they should have driven out completely. God said that. And he's using them as forced labor. So it kind of looks like strategy here. Well, it, he's not using his own people. He's saving them for the army. He's using these other, but they were supposed to be driven out, God said. So, so this is a little compromise. I want you to read further. Verse, verse 23, others were chiefs of the officials who were over Solomon's work, 550 who ruled over the people who did the work. But Pharaoh's daughter came up from the city of David to her house, which Solomon had built for her, and then he built the Milo. Now, three times a year, Solomon offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Now, now, notice this. Three times a year, Solomon offered burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar, which he had built for the Lord. And he burned incense with them on the altar that was before the Lord. And so he finished the temple. Now, again, that looks like, oh, he's worshiping God. This is a compromise. How is it a compromise? Because Solomon is king. He's not a priest. And he's serving in the role of a priest here. Now, you read some Bible commentaries and some say, well, maybe Solomon was actually using the priests in this sacrificial act of worship. But it doesn't say that. What it says here is Solomon offered burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar, which he had built for the Lord, and he burned incense with them on the altar that was before the Lord. And so he finished the temple. Solomon is acting in a role that he's not called to act in. He's taking the role of a priest. And again, on the surface, that might look innocent. But what he's saying is, I got this because I'm that important that I can also not only be king, but I can be priest at the same time, and I can offer these sacrifices to the Lord. He did this three times a year. He's not supposed to be doing this. So what you begin to see here is a man who's slowly letting some cracks into the armor, and he's becoming weak because these little compromises, well, I made it as a point. It's number two from chapter nine. Little compromises lead to big sins. He doesn't, he doesn't get to the place where he's just as outright offering children in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. He starts doing little things along the way to get there. And that's what happens in our lives. Most of the time, you know, we don't, we don't act upon those big sins until we're first committing those little ones, those little compromises 
that just begin to weaken us spiritually until then we're doing the big sins because along the way we've allowed ourselves to have these little compromises. And that's what is happening here with Solomon. His heart is breaking down and we're, and we're, we're seeing it here in these little compromises. And so in verse 26, then Solomon also built a fleet of ships at Azion Geber, which is near Elath, on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. So Elath is the modern city of Elat. It's, it's on the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba, which is the Red Sea. The Red Sea divides into the Gulf of Aqaba and the Gulf of Suez and divides, and in between is the Sinai Peninsula between, of Egypt. And so, but on the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba is the, the port city of Elat. And even today in Israel, Elat is a beautiful, um, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? It's um, resort. It's a resort city today where a lot of people in Israel, they usually take a, f- a short flight down to Elat and it's, it's a beautiful resort now. So this is, King Solomon is building a, a Navy fleet here uh, to be able to access the Red Sea. And it says in verse 27, and then Hiram sent his servants with the fleet, seamen who knew the sea to work with the servants of Solomon. So this is interesting because again, Hiram is the king of Tyre, he's a foreign king. He has good relations with Solomon. He's sending some of his Navy guys, some of his sailors over to Solomon Solomon isn't really familiar with how to, you know, uh, work the fleet of ships. So Hiram gives him a little help here. And notice where they go. It says, and they went to Ophir. Now, nobody knows where Ophir is today. Some Bible scholars say it is in Saudi Arabia. But they go to Ophir and they acquired 420 talents of gold from there and brought it to King Solomon. Now, if you thought 120 talents was a lot of gold back in chapter 10, I mean, sorry, back earlier in chapter 9, uh, back in verse 14, now you got 420 talents of gold. Again, each talent is 70 pounds. So I did the math on this one too. Are you ready for this? You know how much gold he brought back from Ophir? Don't we wish we knew where Ophir was? (laughs) $1.176 billion dollars of gold in today's value. One point, almost $1.2 billion of gold. That's a lot of gold. Now this is another compromise here because Solomon is getting stinky wealthy, which there's nothing wrong with being stinky wealthy, except when you are relying on your wealth now instead of God. When money begins to rule you and you think you're all that, and so this is leading here to more compromise with Solomon. In fact, it's, it's, it's going to tell us that there was so much gold and silver. Silver was like stones. I mean, it was just the, the value. I mean, there was so much of it um, that he was living in the lap of luxury. And so into chapter 10, um, we only got like four minutes, friends. So I think rather than starting into chapter 10, we'll just park it there for tonight and pick it up next week. But into chapter 10, he gets a visit. He gets a visit from the Queen of Sheba. Uh, mm Mm-hmm, yeah, Mm mm-hmm. And Solomon loves his women, remember, right? 700 wives, 300 concubines. And so he loves this visit from the Queen of Sheba. Um, And so we'll get into chapter 10 next week, but for tonight, let's just uh, pause it here, and, and maybe the second point from chapter 9 is, is worth us spending some time praying on, because if there are some little compromises in our lives that the Lord would check us on this evening, maybe it's, it's a good place for us to just come clean with the Lord. So would you just bow your heads with me as we pray? Lord, we don't point a finger at Solomon because we see ourselves. And we realize how easy it is to make these little compromises and not think much of it. But in the end, it often leads to bigger sins. If we don't check ourselves early, what will it lead to? So, Father, I pray right now that you would just help us by your Holy Spirit to examine our own hearts. Are there different ways that we have been compromising 
Are there different things we've been doing that displease you? Bring it to our minds, Lord. Maybe we don't even need to pray this because we know already. We just ask you, Lord, to forgive us. Forgive us for those compromises, Lord. Because not only does it displease you, but it causes us to open the door wider to even bigger sins. So may we always learn from the examples of your word, the good examples and the bad examples, to take to heart these things, to examine our own hearts. What are the ways that we've been compromising? What are the things, Lord, you would say to us tonight? Get rid of that. Stop doing that. Press into me. And so help us, Lord. We desire to live in a way that, as, as you told Solomon, with integrity and uprightness of heart. With integrity and uprightness of heart. You see, Lord, you know. Integrity is doing the right thing even when no one is looking. But you see you know. Uprightness of heart is walking in a way that is honorable, honorable to you, pleasing to you. May those things define us, men and women of integrity and uprightness of heart who follow after you. So we love you, Lord. We thank you that you have given us your word to help us, to guide us, to direct us. And we thank you that you're a merciful Father, that we can come to you confessing our sins, and that you forgive us. You cleanse us, you wash over us, you, pur you purify us, Lord. And so we thank you, we give you praise, we give you honor and glory. Be with us now as we leave this place to go home. Bring us together again on Sunday. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen.